so let me introduce the first uh, presenter uh, from Lithuania. It is Maria Dremaide, who is associate uh, professor at Vilnius University at the Department of History, Theory and Culture and History. And she is an author of several books, several important books. Uh, one is uh, uh, recently uh, published this year. But in this context, it's more important that uh, she is co-author of the book Architecture in Soviet Ukraine, which was published in 2012. And today, Maria uh, will present a paper about the fate of uh, socialist architecture in post-socialist time in all three Baltic countries. Please, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you, Romana. So, I'm really happy to be there. Thanks for organizing it. It's really a pleasure to remember uh, the meeting in Thailand seven years ago, I think. <laughs> it was, um, and today I'm trying to talk about uh, uh, socialist modernism architecture from the perspective of uh, cultural heritage, or as we now introduced uh, from the perspective of the fate. Uh, of these buildings. In 2016, UNESCO World Heritage Committee session inscribed the works of Le Corbusier uh, on the World Heritage List. And it must have been the moment of triumph for many lovers of the modern movement and people who initiated preservation programs for modern architecture. With key works of Mies, Gropius, and other masters, on the World Heritage List, we can be sure that modern movement became established cultural heritage. And what about socialist modernism? It already had its momentum a few years ago with lectures, conferences, and exhibitions. And these events testify to the need to understand and consider socialist past not as a lost, which is better ignored, but rather as a distinctive phenomenon that is still affecting us, exploring which can, at least in part, explain our present. And then my colleagues ask why socialist modernism did not make it to the World Heritage List. We can speculate that Maybe it's because the poor value of socialist modernism, or to put it in other words, because socialist modernists did not produce any world-class architecture icons, or maybe the reason is a less influential community which did not make enough effort to prepare to promote the outstanding nomination. As a good provocation, I would like to mention a book Beliable Forever by Polish researcher Kuba Snopek, who tried to experiment to put a Moscow mass housing area Beliable on the UNESCO World Heritage List and discussed the values of generic architecture. Of course, we can see that it's very stereotype to see socialist modernism as a mass housing, and it is only a research project so far. Or maybe the post-socialist world simply does not love socialist modernism at all, and it is not interested in preserving it. At a recent conference in, on socialist modernism in Berlin, an issue of general refusal of post-war modernism was raised, uh, focusing on an alarming example from Skopje. Macedonia's capital was rebuilt after the 63 earthquake with a modernist city center plan by Japanese architect Kenzo Tange. Now the whole Doric columns and antiquization are transforming the city. Ask it why? Prime Minister Nikola Gruyevsky told that national feelings were suppressed in Tito's Yugoslavia and there were no monuments or statues to express our nationhood. Doesn't it suggest a thought that socialist modernism is not worth preserving at all? It is quite paradoxical, but for the time being it was easier 
to find society's support for the preservation of buildings from the Stalinist period because of the elaborate neoclassical facades uh, perceived as architectural beauty. So architectural historians really had to struggle explaining architectural values of the modernist glass boxes seen on every corner. However, after the Russian invasion in Ukraine two years ago, there began a second wave of revisionism when Soviet period monuments that remained after the first wave of removal in 1990s as rather neutral were questioned again. The real communist legacy that bothered the society was actually sculptural monuments that literally symbolized the Soviet. Some were even taken off last year in Vilnius as a well-known case of Green Bridge. Several years ago, people already thought that communism was a history and when it showed that it wasn't, I think it was an act of panic. But what about the uh, modernist buildings from socialist period that does not speak of communism so explicitly? Wherever I go, my fellow modernists are complaining that socialist modernism is left abandoned and not preserved in their countries. Is it also the case in the Baltic countries? Is it perceived as an ideological other? When I look around, I see that most of the functional buildings are renovated and used for the purposes that they were designed for, schools, shops, offices, hospitals, and even edifices built for communist regimes seem to be adaptable for the representational needs without moral problems, ministries and parliaments operate there. In recent years, there have been significant public campaigns to save socialist era buildings under threat. This rather pragmatic approach was well put by Tallinn Architectural Biennale's topic, Recycling Socialism in 2013. With Biennale, we wanted to take the discussion further by gathering architects, visionaries from all around Europe to find ideas for the future. future. And uh, really, we can see that socialist modernism lived 25 years in socialist period and already 25 years in democratic societies. So it's equal um, periods taken roughly, so we can compare how it's going. Why modernist architecture from the 60s to the 80s in Baltics is so important then? Being the latest to be incorporated in the Soviet Union in 40, with the still present national schools of modern architecture, in the late 50s, Baltic republics generated a form of critical modernism towards Stalinist architecture and became mediators of the Western modernism in the USSR further giving the title of the Inner Abroad, or the Soviet West. Uh, that is a very short summary of popular mythology or the popular story told about Baltic modernism. And here I quote um, one of the Russian uh, journalist and publicist, that Baltic republics actively contributed to the transformation of the aesthetic milieu of Soviet everyday life and uh, to the formation of the new style. So we can see that for the generation of young Baltic architects born in the 30s, graduated in the 50s, this Khrushchevian before in 55 encouraged the process of cultural liberation that could be characterized by a clear emergence of national, western-oriented and modernist aspects of culture. And here you can see the uh, famous uh, cover of the Architecture de Jardin, the famous um, uh, modern contemporary architecture magazine from the 69, uh, which featured Soviet architecture, and uh, Baltic uh, modernism was also featured there. But this cover, this picture was taken from the personal archive of one famous Lithuanian modernist, Ivonas Chikhanauskas, and uh, you can see that three uh, three flags are crossed here. It's Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. It's his personal approach. And uh, we can interpret it as we are not Sovietic. 
that, but who we are then and how we, uh, how Baltic states are positioned. Georgi Peteri, who edited a book imagining the West in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union, developed a concept of symbolic geographies that reveal how human agents, in particular historical and cultural contexts, define themselves by locating themselves in spatially as well as temporarily drawing the boundaries of social spaces where they are within and relating themselves and their spaces to others. What makes these socially and historically situated processes really important is their intimate relationship to the formation of identities and indeed to identity politics. And if we use this theory and interpret, the, we can trace that temporal geography or the modernism from the pre-war independent states as an important source of inspiration. And another spatial symbolical geography can be perceived as an interpretation of the Western modernism or the imagined worst, first of all. And well, when the possibility to visit capitalist countries, and especially Finland, made important <coughs> influence, in the Nordic regional modernism, Baltic architects, at least Lithuanian architects, saw the features that they were aspiring to, an acceptable combination of the international modernism with regional identity. Therefore, the national modernism in the Baltic republics was based on the use of local materials like red brick, stone, wood, combination of natural light and respect to natural environment and historical heritage, mainly urban heritage. First, it was experimented in relatively small uh, designs, for example, for interiors, recreation pavilions, and cafes. Later, designs for major commissions employed modernism, like for the national highlights, like the Palace of Art exhibitions in Vilnius Dialect Theatre in Riga or Song Festival Arena in Tallinn. But officially, Baltic design contributed for the Soviet urban planning. The first state and Lenin awards in the USSR were given to Lithuanian and Estonian mass housing micro rayons and the Baltic collective farm settlements, and were also widely used for propaganda reasons as Soviet architectural achievements. And in 1988, the Lenin Award went to the Lithuanian state farm Yuknaiji for completely different garden city and individualization approach of the Kolhoks architecture. So it is evident that these designs were not following but setting the new standards and changing ideals for the Soviet architecture together with critical processes in the late Soviet period, for example, the Thailand, the famous Tallinn school, uh, acted as a platform for presenting a criticism of building regulations. Baltic architecture really earned the reputation of a very strong Western-oriented architectural school with strong regional identity. And of course, they loved it. So what are we actually, actually longing for today? There are, hmm, there are different types of longing, one of which the architects longing for the lost honorable status of the master after the fall of modernism and entire system. In the East and in the West alike, there were architects whose personal vision coincided with the official one, and this became key to their success. This is related to the urban legends that have subsequently arisen. Lithuanian architects like telling stories about their silent resistance to the Soviet regime. By repeating it again and again, they uphold the myth of the exclusivity of architecture of the Baltic states. According to Andrei Skurk, who is sitting in the hall, the loss of strong positions in 1990, when an architect became just a part of a real estate development program, encouraged a nostalgic feeling for former positions and former powers. 
It's quite paradox paradoxical, I quote. They became theoreticians when they lost their power as architects. I think they, not, they are nostalgic for their lost status in society. So, we have reached a turning point when many European architects consider socialist modernism as historical architecture. And it's no wonder that almost more than 20 pieces of socialist modernism are listed in the Fiorini, and most of them were listed back in 1988 as the achievements of the socialist Lithuania, and it was initiated mostly by architects themselves. Most of them stood out the time challenge and now are on the renewed list after revision. An illustrative case is the Neringa Cafe interior in Vilnius that was listed almost uh, already in the Soviet period. During the wild 90s, when all private cafes and restaurants refurbished their interiors, the Neringa Cafe and Hotel was bought by the Nordic investors. With respect to the listed interior, they have restored it. That is how the only authentic socialist modernism interior was survived, has survived and now is in great respect. There are a lot of socialist in the essence buildings that continue successfully their function and duties, functional duties. Former Latvian Communist Party Central Committee building is now functioning as the World Trade Center, one of the most prestigious building, office buildings in Riga. The same building of the Lithuanian Communist Party is now functioning as the premises of Lithuanian government. And in Estonia, it is now home to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The same can be said about the houses of political education that were built as modern educational buildings containing large halls and number of classes. Former House of Political Education in Riga is now Riga Congress Center. House of Political Education in Kaunas was adapted to the university premises, whereas in Vilnius it was not completed by the collapse of the Soviet, Soviet Lithuania and was immediately turned to the Congress Hall. Famous cultural buildings like Dailas Theatre in Riga and Opera and Ballet Theatre in Vilnius continued to function after thorough renovations. Revolution Museum in Vilnius was successfully renovated and adapted to the new use as a national gallery. The Red Latvian Rifleman Museum and Monument was also adapted to the new Museum of the Occupation of Latvia. And there are, of course, many more functional buildings that are being used and are being renovated, however, with much less attention to their architecture than function. I talk about architecturally important hospitals, schools, and other functional buildings. And there are still many problematic cases, of course, that are connected to the functions of the socialist society that are not anymore in use. For example, this uh, wedding palace of weddings in Vilnius is uh, perfectly adapted to the new secular society, and urban secular society, and is in need. But in smaller towns, these uh, wedding palaces are not in use anymore because the, uh, people are choosing other premises for their wedding ceremonies. Also, this uh, funeral home in Kaunas, which was built in 78 for special purposes of secular funeral ritual, is a very interesting building, both from the functional as well as architectural point of view. And it is listed. However, it is not in use anymore, and it is really difficult to adapt it to new uses. However, when there, are, is, uh, there is a strategic interest in replacing a socialist building, socialist legacy is usually used in a negative way. This was said about the palace of sports and concerts in Vilnius when there was a need to demolish it and use its plot. It was called the Soviet Concrete Monster. Then it was listed in 2006 and continued to stand derelict until it got included into the major redevelopment project for the National Congress Center. And now it is called an interesting architecturally and technologically building from the 60s. 
There are also many significant buildings that did not survive, like the beautiful restaurant Juras Perle on the Latvian beach. And demolition of these buildings is not usually ideological, but rather economical, usually a new development project. However, demolition of the restaurant Banga on the Lithuanian beach in Palanga last year it brings a rather alarming Skopje-like message because you can see the new, uh, new design which is proposed in the place of demolished building. So, what is the future? Uh, taking into account that 75% of our built, heritage, built environment was built in the post-war period, we of course uh, uh, understand that we cannot list everything and pro protect everything and not everything is worth protecting. And the attitude towards the socialist modernism has been changing over time. <coughs> and the judging aspect has been gradually diminishing backwardness in comparison to the best or being in search for Western copies, which is very attractive, of course, but more contextual can questions appear. What were the conditions of the time? Why were such commissions made? In the post-socialist world, an evaluation of architecture based on ideology is no longer relevant. Even more so, buildings of the socialist modernism are being devastated more often, not because they are socialist, but because of their strategic lo locations in the city centers under the pressure of developers or any commercial interest. Uh, there is still a big issue with aesthetical acceptance of socialist modernism, which looks standard, industrial, gray, and dull for many. In discussing the various judgments on the heritage of modernist architecture, one could feel the same suspicions. suspicion. How much are such judgments influenced by different forms of nostalgia? And how much by a truly critical outlook? If it really is nostalgia, it is possible to is it possible to reconcile with the critical thinking? And if it really is nostalgia, whose nostalgia is it and nostalgia for what?